the day after an election is a good day to talk about encouragement. So we are in chapter 4. If you have the copy of the book with you and you want to follow along, uh, I didn't necessarily pay attention to how Mark was going through his material, but I kind of follow the, the chapter uh, as the author laid it out. So question is, how can you tell if a person has been encouraged? There's a smile on their face. What else? They feel good. What else? They have a positive attitude. What else? Their heart grows bigger. Hey, you must have seen the... Yeah. You can't watch that until after Thanksgiving. Oh, okay. Body, whole body language changes, yeah. Anything else? I think they feel like encouraging other people. They feel like encouraging other people, yeah. So they've had their bucket full, and now they're ready to share it with someone else. We're going to get to a passage where Paul says that very thing in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. The, the author, Aubrey Johnson, had this quotation from, I'm assuming he's a Russian, Vladimir Zorinki? Zorkin? Uh, anyway, imposing limitations on yourself is cowardly because it protects you from having to try and perhaps failing. How, how, do you, how do you respond to that quotation? You agree or disagree? Did it make you feel good? Did it make you feel bad? What do you think, Dale? I think it's, a true statement. it's a true statement. How many times do we choose not to do something because we're afraid we're going to fail. Too often. We settle. We stay where we are and we don't grow. We don't challenge ourselves. How many times have I asked you, are, are you a stronger Christian this year than you were last year? And how do you know? What's the measurement that you use to decide if you're a stronger Christian? The Possibilities of Encouragement is the title of this chapter. Encouragement is a process of inspiring others to live with greater hope and courage. Um, hope, of course, is the biblical word for optimism. Optimism is not in the Bible. I don't, there might be a translation out there somewhere that uses optimism, but hope is the biblical word, hope and faith. Practically speaking, it is the ability to leave people feeling more positive and confident after interacting with them. Notice that the definition of encouragement that he gives there doesn't mean that we change the situation. Encouraging someone doesn't necessarily mean we're changing the situation. What we're doing is we're changing the way we look at the situation. And that can make all the difference. They can make all the difference how we view something. Do we, like the Israelites, when God, Moses sent them to spy out the, the promised land, and, and they said, those people in the land are giants. They forgot that they served the God who made the giants. So how do you look at the problem? He had a section called Encouragement Zones. Is there a sphere of life where encouragement is not needed? No. Everybody needs encouragement, right? And we need encouragement in every aspect of our lives. We need encouragement as parents. We need encouragement as children. We need encouragement as husbands. We need encouragement as wives. We need encouragement as employers. We need encouragement as employees. Uh, the list goes on and on, right? Everybody. Now, you could be in a situation where you don't get any encouragement at work. 
What kind of mentality do you have coming home if you don't get any encouragement from work? <laughs> your, your, your level of heart <laughs> is way down here, isn't it? <laughs> because if you're in an environment like work where you don't get any encouragement, then in order to stay mentally healthy, I don't know what is it that kicks in, but you have to encourage yourself. So if you're encouraging yourself in this environment to, in order to keep your, your mental sanity, then when you get home, your encouragement level is really low because you've been having to put it all out over here. So then what happens when you get home? You don't have any encouragement to give anybody else. Why? Because your encouragement level has already been depleted. Maybe that helps us understand why sometimes we come home and snap at our spouse. And we're like, wow, where did that come from? Well, it's because... You gave and gave and gave at work in order to keep your mental health up here. Maybe spiritual health. Aubrey Johnson writes, The church alone can offer meaningful answers to what ails mankind. Only the church can provide the encouragement needed to face reality rather than simply talking about it or escaping from it. How? How is it the case that the church can provide the encouragement needed to face reality? Let's say holistic encouragement. Encouragement for the whole person. How is it that the church can provide that? Just showing that they care. Showing that they care? Okay, so we can encourage each other. One person is in, uh, encouraged and they encourage somebody else. We have common goals. Keep going. Yeah. That wasn't very far. Okay, so Christians have Christians have commonality that makes us family. Okay, so we we I started to answer the question, but Penny, go ahead. Yeah. Right. There you go. Other places don't deal with the soul. That's right. So the church, which of course is focused on God's word, and, and, and this right here is really the reason why we, ha we, can, we can encourage holistically. But the church, of course, is concerned about the spirit of man. And we build up the spirit. Everything else is a whole lot easier to handle. I saw Penny was talking about the different aspects of life. Uh, just, just talking about the Swartz Creek congregation. We've got individuals here who can put you on the right path when it comes to what you eat, how you exercise. We've got individuals here that help put you on the right path relative to how you handle your finances. So there's lots of different ways that the church here could encourage someone who needs encouragement with the spirit of man being at the center of it all. And of course, when we come to worship, every time we come to worship, when we sing songs and praises and we talk to God in prayer and, and we think about what Jesus did for us on the cross and how He removed the barrier of sin, which is the biggest discouragement there is, uh, and all of that, surely that would encourage us. Rachel? Self-help books, a lot of them are based off of biblical principles. Yeah. How would you respond if somebody, maybe you've heard somebody say this, how do you respond if someone talking about worship, they say, well, I didn't get anything out of it. <laughs> what did they put into it? That's, that's the exact right answer, isn't it? Were they listening? What did you put into it? Did you sing? Did you put your heart into the prayer? Did you have your Bible open following along in the, the lesson, the sermon? Yeah, we get out of things pretty much what we put into it, don't we? Our attitude, Our, <laughs> the attitude makes the big difference. 
How do people feel a result of being with me? These are some questions that Johnson kind of challenges us to ask ourselves. Is my spouse happier when they're with me? Do my children look forward to seeing me? It might be, my dad's passed away now, it might make you sad to hear me say this, but there was a period of time in our life when I hated to hear dad coming home. Now, I wouldn't say that about the whole time I was growing up, but there was a period in his life, and as a kid, I didn't know what was going on in his life, other than the fact that as a preacher we were moving every two years. But there was a period of time where I just dreaded Dad coming home. And it wasn't because he was mean, it's just because his attitude was different. His demeanor was different. It's just... No, I, I wasn't going through hormones. Do people come to me for encouragement, for advice? That's one of the questions that Johnson challenges us to ask ourselves. Do we care ourselves in such a way, being around other people, uh, that, that it makes people feel good about being around us? Any thoughts? How is defining success in terms of superiority to others discouraging? We think about how society defines success. How is defining success in terms of superiority to others discouraging? It does what to self-esteem? It lowers our self-esteem. Yeah. It seems like a measure where there is a budget of success. If someone is going to be successful, someone has to be less successful. Thinking in that term, if you're successful, you, uh, you know, put in someone's face, they can think they can't be successful. Yeah. That, we, we get envious with other people being successful. And, and that doesn't, just because somebody else is successful doesn't mean I can't be successful, right? Rejoice with those who rejoice, Paul writes in Romans 12, Mark. I was going to say, it depends, if you read that, are you the person who's got the superiority complex or are you the person being discouraged? <laughs> right? Yeah. If you're looking up, you're going to be discouraged because they got there somehow, which is what Jeff was saying. They kind of, they made stuff on you. Right. On the way up. But if you're looking down, Mm -hmm. Then you got a pride problem. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have contentment because we're struggling comparing ourselves to other people. Marvin, were you going to say something? No, I was just shaking my head. Okay. All right, if you, if you scratch your nose in here, you're going to buy a pew. Jessica? There's always going to be somebody faster, stronger, smarter, yeah. more handsome, prettier, whatever. Always, right? There's always going to be. Right. Betty? Right. Yeah, so I need to be, I need to try to be better, not better than you. I need to be better than me yesterday, right? I need to challenge myself to grow. If we want to compare ourselves to somebody, compare ourselves to Jesus. Now, who's going to fall short when they do that? Everybody. So, Mark was talking about, am I the one that's being compared to, or am I the one that's comparing myself to, well... Isn't it also true that we, we can always find somebody that we're better than? I'm better than somebody, but I'm not as good as somebody else. So comparing ourselves to society's standards is going to be depressing. Right. 
comparing two different people with different talents. When I was a kid, I, I did not think that I could be a preacher because my dad was a preacher and dad was very, very effective in evangelism. Dad could talk the horns off a billy goat and get the billy goat in a Bible study and then baptize him. We were living in Viola Battery, Alabama in 1979 when Hurricane Frederick came through and after the destruction of that hurricane, Dad bought his first chainsaw and he and the boys went to work, well, two boys and my sister, went to work cleaning up people's yards from the damage and Dad would get people in Bible studies all the time. I thought Jill Miller was one of the apostles because we watched the Jill Miller film strips all the time. Dad was baptizing people left and right. That was in 79. I was eight years old. So at eight years old, I saw what Dad was doing, and I knew I couldn't do it even at eight years old. And when I turned 16 years old, I knew I couldn't do that. I don't have that personality. Dad's on the extrovert end. I'm on the introverted end. And I thought, well, I can't be a preacher because I can't be Dad. put limitations on myself because of the way I defined what a preacher could be. But, and I won't go into all of the details, but I wound up finding, y'all know a lot of preachers, right? Swartz Creek's had a bazillion preachers over the years, and, and even if you worship somewhere else, you've, you've been exposed to all kinds of preachers. And every preacher has their own uni unique strengths, right? Every preacher has their own unique strengths. So I found my niche. And I realized my niche was not talking to somebody in the, in the line at the grocery store. Now, if they asked me for a Bible study, I could take off with it. But I'm not dad. And as long as I was comparing myself to dad, I was going to stay out of the ministry. So we don't need to compare ourselves to other people. As Betty said, it was a very good point. We need to compare ourselves to what we were doing yesterday. Or last year? Have we grown? Are we maturing? Are we trying to be more like Christ? He had a section on seclusion. Taking time for others is fundamental to relating effectively. Now isn't that true? Spending time with people. When we went through that two, three-month period at the beginning of COVID where everybody was staying at home. Again, I'm an introvert. Give me a book, and I don't care how much snow's on the ground. I'm happy. But after two months of not seeing anybody and talking to anybody, I was getting stir-crazy. Even introverts need human interaction. Not just to be encouraged, but to encourage so it took maybe a month or so before I started calling everybody in the congregation because I needed some interaction. I had to find out, how are you doing? What opportunities to encourage are present at a typical worship service? We talked about the fact that we can't encourage holistically, but what are some specific opportunities to encourage at a worship service? We encourage others by our singing, as long as they can hear us. If somebody sings off-key, does that encourage you? The fact that they're, they're trying. Now you're backtracking to that superiority. Yeah. Smile. Speak to them, say hi. Yeah. Because there's people Yeah. I don't doubt that some of us that do try to get around and visit people, sometimes we walk right by somebody who might have thought that we were going to stop talking to them, but we've got our eyes on a visitor or maybe somebody we hadn't talked to in several weeks and we walk right by somebody else and they're like, well, what am I, chopped liver? Irene?
Yeah. James refers to it as a like... No, Peter refers to it as a like precious faith. Being around people that have the same faith. Jessica? Yeah, sometimes people go forward just because they need encouragement, right? And we encourage them. I am encouraged when other people go up and sit with somebody that's gone forward. Don't y'all like that? Isn't that encouraging? I like it when there's so many people sitting around the person that the shepherd doesn't have anywhere to sit. That's a good thing. We went... We canceled worship services, in-person worship in March. Started it back in June. Sunday morning worship. We didn't start Sunday evening worship until December of 2020. I had Rachel go back and look at the numbers. The few weeks leading up to that December opening of Sunday evening worship, I had maybe half a dozen members say, Paul, we'd, I think we'd like to start back Sunday night services. It just doesn't seem like the week is complete if we don't get together for worship Sunday night. Maybe half a dozen. So we talked about it in, in the elders meeting and we were wondering, well, how many people are going to show up? Half a dozen? How many people want to be here Sunday night? There was 33 here that first Sunday night. 33 the first Sunday night in December 20 of 2020. Last Sunday night we had 82. Which is getting pretty, pretty close to the pre-COVID number. So we went from 33 to 82 because Christians said, you know what, it's good to be here. How many people have we heard say... I'm thankful that we could worship online, but I prefer to worship in person. It's just not the same, is it? It's hard to sing praises by yourself, unless you got a family that's assembled around the computer, and that's a little awkward, but... Yep. Speaking of, speaking of singing... I did. Find, I have found somebody who sings worse than I do. Why are you looking at me, I, it's, a, it's a Romanian preacher, uh, and I was sitting pretty close to him during worship service. We were over there one time, and I thought, man, he doesn't. He sings. He sings worse than I do. But it warmed my heart because he was singing from his heart, and that's what's important, isn't it? He encouraged me because he was worshiping God from his heart. Mark? God's tone deaf. The God's tone deaf, so to speak. Marvin? Yep. And the whole thing boils down to human interaction. That's a good... There's people around you, whether you're at a stadium or in the... That's a good illustration. I've watched lots of Alabama games on TV, but last November we went to a, a game in person, first time I've ever been to an Alabama game in person. A and Marvin's right that it's completely different. It's very different. The energy level is way up here. Not to mention the fact that Rachel now has become a fan of football. That's the best $500 I've ever spent. She's, she was the one who said, when are we going to go back? Being there in person. And that's the way worship ought to be. In fact, Hebrews 10, 25, you all know what Hebrews 10, 25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the habit of some is, but encouraging one another. And the more as you see the day approaching... Looking forward to being back with Christians. It should be that way. If it's not, you got to tell us. Something's not going on right. 
It's critical to the services of the church. Johnson writes, handshakes, hugs, joining together in prayer and song. Some of that you just can't get through live stream. Can't shake hands through live stream. Can't give hugs through live. Of course, you weren't supposed to be doing that during COVID anyway, but uh, there's just something missing when you're not there in person. Why does selfishness limit a person's ability to encourage others? Jessica? Yeah, you just care about yourself, thinking about yourself. Yeah, if you have a woe is me mentality, you're just thinking about me, right? You're not thinking about other people. Yeah. How can low self-esteem make it more difficult to encourage others? Right, and if you don't feel good about yourself... What do you tend to do to other people? Bring them down, right? We tend to pick other people apart because we feel badly about ourselves. I think one reason why Jesus was able to be... I think Jesus was able to, to bend over and wash his disciples' feet because he was comfortable with who he was. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, have this mind being you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself a no reputation, taking on the form of a servant and being made in likeness of man. He humbled himself unto death, even the death on the cross. So Paul begins there in verse 5 by saying Jesus is equal with God. But he was not willing to, to hang on to that, poured himself out onto earth so that he could wash his disciples' feet. If we've got a healthy self-esteem, because we're thankful for how God made us, that is the source of a healthy self-esteem. It's not self-love. The Bible condemns self-love. The essence of healthy self-esteem is thankfulness for how God made me. God didn't make me to be you. And that's why I don't need to compare myself to you. I need to be thankful for how God made me and use the talents God has given to me in order to make my life better. Rachel? Okay, it'll come to you. Experience. Encouragement is a learned skill. We talked two weeks ago, last time I taught the class, two weeks ago we talked about courage and how courage is a decision, right? A firefighter has to make a decision to run into the building that's on fire. Courage is looking at fear, acknowledging the fear, and then doing what needs to be done despite the fear. Encouragement is the same thing. It's making a decision to do something, either say words that are encouraging or do something that is encouraging. It's an action. And that's why it's a skill that can be learned. Now one thing that we have to learn is to taste our words before we spit them out of our mouth. One of the things we'll learn as we read through this book is that discouragement oftentimes comes from the words we use or the tone of voice. And so we have to be careful about that. But it's a learned skill. Betty? Yep. If we feel down, we should go try to help somebody else. And we'll be encouraged because we're doing what God wants us to do. Do y'all remember what God told Elijah to do when Elijah was depressed and wanted God to kill him? What did, what did God tell Elijah to do? He told him to get up and go to work. Quit sitting here on your haunches in the cave all by yourself singing, woe is me. Get up and go to work. 
anoint Hazael as king of Syria and anoint Elisha as your co-worker. Now, isn't that interesting? He said, you go find somebody to help you. Delegate. And he fed him. Part of Elisha's depression came from the fact that he had run a thousand miles to get away from Queen Jezebel who put a price on his head and he hadn't eaten in days. And a lot of times our depression comes from not, you know, physical problems. Not eating right, not exercising, things like that. Uh, and hormones too. How does a lack of commitment hinder the ability to encourage? Let's talk about commitment. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, so Sue says you can plan to be encouraging. You can uh, look at the bulletin and see people that need to, to have cards or somebody that needs to have a meal taken to them. Look at this list of, how, how do you define it, Rachel? Uh, people in rehab and assisted living. We've got people with cancer, shut-ins. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, she's got a, a list of shut-ins and, and those with cancer. For phone numbers? How many of you love to talk on the phone? You want to raise your hand? How many of you love, love to talk on the phone? A couple of you? How many of you like to write cards? A few more would rather write cards and talk on the phone. COVID changed me. In all of my ministry up until 2020, I would rather drive 30 minutes to talk to a, a member of the church face-to-face -face than spend 10 minutes with them on the phone. I'm not a phone person. I'd rather go talk in person. But because of COVID, I have shifted now, and I spend a lot more time on the phone than I do driving. I can call more people in five days than, than driving, but I still would prefer just talking face-to-face. Jesus told that to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Peter was discouraging him by saying that he would not be killed if he went to Jerusalem. I believe that's in uh, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 23. And Jesus said, uh, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. He turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. So what was the origin of Peter's discouraging words there? Why was he being discouraging? He didn't want him to go. He was thinking, Jesus says, you have your mind on man's interest, not God's interests. Right. They didn't understand all the... Mm -hmm. Yeah. They didn't understand what he was intending to do, did they? Where is encouragement without the ability to stick with relationships and obligations? Commitment. Because sometimes people can be discouraging to us. A spouse can be discouraging to us. But we're committed to the relationship and so we are going to feed into the relationship because it needs to be fed, right? What is... That can be hard on a person if they're trying to give, 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 and they're never getting it. Right. If you, if you empty your bucket because you continue to give, then at some point you're going to have an empty bucket, right? 
So we need to be encouraged, but we've got to have the commitment to whatever relationship it is, my relationship with you as a member of the same congregation or whatever, we need commitment to that relationship, right, Sue? Or when you write the card, you can you can say a prayer, and then write the card, and then you can say, "I have prayed for you." You can say, "I just prayed for you." You don't necessarily have to say, "I pray for you every day." The sermon this past Sunday morning was on the art of loving. Love endures. What did you learn about perseverance from my sermon Sunday morning? How many of you were listening? You got to think about it. Look back at your notes. <laughs> I did not say there was going to be a test. Pop quiz. It's intentional. Like all of Christianity is, right? Put it in your mind that you're going to do it. Yeah. Praying or, or writing cards. We've got these postcards that Karen Racowin now takes care of for us. Whoops, that's a visitor card. These little cards here, little heart. Yeah. Yeah. In fact... I sent a card to a preacher friend of mine uh, just a few weeks ago, and he put it up on his laptop and took a picture of it and then texted me and said, thank you for the card that he just got. Johnson directs us to these three points. Encouragement as an act of love, encouragement loves. Matthew 22 and verse 39 is the second greatest commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Encouragement comforts. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 18. That we are told to do these things. These are commands of Christ. Somebody read 1 Thessalonians 4.18 when you get to it. Out loud. Therefore encourage one another with these words. And it's not. Therefore encourage one another with these words. What he said already. What he said in the previous four chapters. <laughs> encourage one another with these words. This, in fact, is at the very end of him talking about the second coming of Christ. Uh, Christ is going to come and he's going to uh, put an end to all this foolishness. But uh, comfort one another. Jesus is coming back again. And he also tells us to do good. Galatians 6 and verse 10. Do good to who? Yeah. Do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of the faith. Who are the household of the faith? Us. <laughs> Christians, right? Those who are of the household of the faith, the Christian faith. So people need encouragement. They need encouragement to know they are valued. They need encouragement to know that somebody believes in them so they can value and believe in themselves. Find humor in minor disasters. A good way to get over it is to laugh about it. Sometimes it might take a week or two before you can't laugh about it, but 
as long as there was no serious injury done, remain composed in stressful situations. It's hard to keep other people encouraged if we're losing our mind because we're stressed out. So we have to remind ourselves that God is in control. Name some situations where you have observed the need for encouragement. What are some, what are some situations where, where you need encouragement? Loss of a loved one. I was thinking of a funeral service. Yeah. That environment, yes. When there's sickness. Just like tonight when I come in and ask for prayers for our kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. When, you, when your family or you are being prayed for by other people, it's encouraging. When I had this, the fight with this kidney stone this last summer, uh, when I got the secondary infection, I was confused and frustrated because my body was doing things that I didn't know it was going to be doing. And I wound up texting Dr. Tory, and, you know, we're talking about holistic uh, encouragement here at church. So I, I texted Dr. Torrey and I said, here's what's going on. What do I need to be doing? And he said, well, number one, you're doing this wrong. And number two, start doing this. Uh, so in fact, I was, I was texting Tori every day for about four or five days and I apologized for annoying him. And he said, no, that's fine. He just brushes it off like it's no big deal. But it was, it was tremendous. On a scale from one to 10 on the encouragement scale, it was a 12 because I was frustrated with, with my ignorance and I didn't know what was going on and didn't know what to do. And Tori was over there, calm as a cucumber, just saying, Paul, do this and quit doing that. What are some other situations where you need encouragement? Do what we can to help them. We may be able to relate with them, or we may be able to find somebody else who can relate to them. I've not gone through what you're going through, but I know somebody who has been through what you've gone through, and maybe I can get them to, to talk to you. That's one reason why I try to find people in, uh, to write articles for the Christian Family Magazine, because they've gone through things like death in the family and divorce and things like that, and I want them to write and share with other people what they've gone through. It. Death of a child? What, what, what do you feel in your heart when you go through the death of a child? How do you handle it? How, how, does, how does your faith in Christ help you, sustain you? I want people to write about that so I, we can share it with others so other people will find hope and encouragement in those words. Yeah. I don't You gotta spend time with people in order to feel comfortable talking about some things like that, right? People do not open up to a preacher until he's been there about five or six years. I, I found that to be true. You talk about uh, uh, somebody that's having some, some marriage problems or challenges with their children that they're just not going to open up to people. They have to, they have to be around the preacher for years before they're, they're willing to open up. You've got to build that trust. You've got to build a bridge of trust. These are the 10 points at the very end of the chapter, 10 reminders for encouragers. Number one, encourage other people the way that you want to be encouraged. What rule is that? (laughs) The golden rule, Matthew 7 and verse 12. Number two, people generally treat you how you treat them. If you smile at the world, the world generally smiles back at you. If you encourage the world, the world will generally encourage you. If you run into a cashier at the store who's having a bad day, a soft answer turns away wrath.
Some people, yeah. Some people just need to have somebody to listen to them. And that's encouraging to them. In fact, 90% of a counselor's job is just to listen. Just listen. Number three, your time, talent, and treasures are trusts given by God. Philippians 1, 20 through 25. Let's turn and look at that. Philippians 1, 20 through 25. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain, Paul says. Nevertheless, it's advantageous for me to be here with you. No, I want us to read it. Somebody read it when you get to it. Philippians 1, 20 through 25. Yeah, 20 20 through 25. So notice Paul says, if God wants me to stay here on earth, then I'm going to do what I can to help in the progress of your faith. If God wants me to stay here, I'm going to use my time to strengthen you, to encourage you. Number four, we need to prize people. Use things, encourage people. People are important. Souls are important. Number five, encouragement is an act of love for God. Right? 1 John 4, 20 and 21. If our brother has need of encouragement and we give them that encouragement, then we're showing our love for God. How can we say that we love our love God whom we have not seen and not love our brother whom we have seen? There's a few Sundays ago in, the, in, in Cody's class where he made the comment that he thinks probably more Christians are going, to be, are going to lose their souls because of their relationships with other Christians more than false doctrine. And there may be some truth to that. God is love, right. And so we love other people. We're showing our, showing our Christianity. In fact, that's number six. Encouragement is an act of love for Christ. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 40 is the, some people call it a parable, where where the king separates the sheep from the goats. And and he says, Enter into the joy of your Lord because I was hungry and you fed me and I was thirsty and you gave me to drink and I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and in prison and you visited me. And, And the sheep said, When did we do all this? And what did Jesus say? When you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. So showing encouragement is an act of love for Christ. Number seven, we all answer for a relationship placed in our care. Stewards are supposed to be found faithful. So what does this mean that we're going to 
we're accountable for the relationships that are put into our care. What does it mean? So we're either encouraging or we're discouraging. Right. So we've got these relationships in our hands, and the relationships that are in our hands are, are everybody we come in contact with. Every single person we come in contact with is a relationship in our hands. What are we doing with it? Are we reflecting Christ to them, or are we not reflecting Christ to them? One or the other. By your word, you will be justified, and by your word, you will be condemned. Matthew 12 and verse 37. So we need to take seriously the, the stewardship of relationships. That sounds like a good title for a sermon. Stewardship of relationships. Uh, number eight, encouragement is a daily privilege and responsibility. Hebrews 3 and verse 13. As long as it's called today. Uh, number nine, God encourages us so we can encourage others. That's 2 Corinthians 1 verses 3 and 4. Uh, read those two verses and, and circle or highlight every time Paul uses the word comfort. God comforts us in our tribulations so that we can comfort others with the same comfort by which God has comforted us um, five times. And number 10, church assemblies are great opportunities to encourage. Now, of course, the whole theme of the letter of Hebrews is that Jesus is superior to everything because the, the recipients of that letter were in danger of leaving Christ. And so everything has to do with our connection to Christ, and that's the context of Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Encourage one another to stimulate one another to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. So the context of being in worship is to encourage each other. Because that's how important Jesus sees encouragement. We don't have time to talk about rules for encouragers. I should have started with that because I think y'all give a really good list of rules. This week, he challenges us to pray for God to help us to overcome obstacles that could hinder our encouragement for other people and encourage a child. Grab two dozen of these postcards and write a little note to our kids and our young people and our teenagers and our college students. Okay, so come to the ladies' prayer breakfast and do some of this postcard writing at the ladies' prayer breakfast. Little Roger Music used his own money and bought me this hat. Now, I've got a T-shirt with this exact same pattern on it. He didn't know it, but now I've got a T-shirt and a hat that matches. And so I wrote a little postcard to him thanking him for buying me that hat and his mom and dad said he just went crazy with that postcard stuck in his bible so we could keep it first piece of mail he was nine years old first piece of mail because people don't send handwritten stuff anymore do they yeah yeah getting mail is a big deal Anybody else have anything, any comments you'd like to add? Mark will uh, lead the study next week on the anatomy of an encourager, the mind. So the next five chapters now are going to be talking about skills to use to be an encourager. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful again that we can come before your throne of grace. We're thankful, Father, that you are a God of encouragement. And we pray that you will help us to learn from you so that we can be a source of encouragement to others in order to make the Swartz Creek Church of Christ as strong as it can be. Keep us through the night and bless us with a good day tomorrow. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.